Perry and Waukee. And I think they, Cindy, if you could bring up on the uh, screens there, I think they submitted some pictures of what these look like. Melissa, were those the ones that were in Waukee and Perry or were those just examples? Uh, they were the, these are from the more recent email. These are from uh, Waukee. Yeah. Okay. So if you scroll through these, these appear to be also in a um, more rural setting on gravel roads, which we don't use salts in the de-icers. Um, so that would, that's just, we just want to make sure that we're comparing apples with apples here. Um, another issue that, that we've got or we've raised is the uh, aluminum durability. Um, I believe the, the thickness on the aluminum structure is about an eighth of an inch thick, um, is what they've requested to use. Our concrete pipes, our walls are three inches thick on those as well, on those. So, um, they, they had talked about kind of a 50 year life cycle um, or 50 year design on those. And that was at half of that thickness. So they just attributed that that 50 years, if you double the thickness, you doubled the, the life. But that's not the case if you start pitting and that starts breaking down. Um, and we couldn't find any information in the materials to back that um, claim up as well. Um, so in our concrete pipe has a design life of 75 to 100 years. So it's just been more of a proven um, material here in the metro. Uh, and then again, um, the other thing is we reached out to our consulting engineer and they also have concerns with abrasion and the durability of the pipe. Uh, they recently spoke to a contractor that has installed one of uh, a structural plate pipe and they've had to go back and deal with some settlement issues around that pipe. Um, if that was outside of the bond period, the city would be responsible for those maintenance costs. So that's just another concern of ours. So that's why staff and, and our uh, engineer have recommended that we use, that we follow the specifications and use the concrete reinforced pipe. Be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Matt? So oh, there's this photo in here that says Crosshaven GS. Yes. Is that, um, so that's in Johnston? So yeah, that's the arch pipe that we, or the structural <coughs> plate pipe. It's a galvanized pipe um, that was allowed by our specifications um, in the early, I think that was put in in like 2017, 2016. Um, you can see in the lower right hand corner where it's beginning to rust on the pipe at that water level. Um, this was allowed by specification at the time when Crosshaven was constructed. We kind of watched that, reviewed that over a few years. And this is one of the one of the reasons that we wrote this type of material out of our specification. Now I know theirs is different. Theirs is an aluminum pipe, but we still have some of the same concerns. Other questions for Matt? Ryan? Matt, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly. One of the attractive things about this uh, kind of ellipse style uh, aluminum is that it does allow for kind of a creek bed at the bottom. And, and I, I, I presume that's what you meant by mitigation um, possibilities. The concrete uh, culvert or piping, that also allows for mitigation? Yeah, they, uh, we looked at oversizing that. A 60-inch pipe is what would be needed to carry the flow of water through that. So we upsized to a 72 so they could sink that and get that natural creek bed through there as well. Okay. To help lower those mitigation costs. Thank you. Any other questions for me? Okay. We need to hear... Yeah. Hi, Melissa Hill, CEC. Um, the one thing that I, the, the things that I guess I'd like to point out is that the, the Crosshaven project that was steel and not aluminum, and and the aluminum alloy that we're proposing um, is more inert and doesn't react like steel does to um, to water and oxygen. So. Um, that we're not comparing apples to apples if you look at that culvert and they also had some issues with the their end treatment because the two materials react differently to hot and cold so they're having some issues with that culvert because of the end treatment 
uh, being different than the pipe material. So, um, so I guess if you're looking at that picture and thinking it doesn't look good, it's probably because it wasn't a great design. Um, Actually, I thought it looked better than the Waukee or the Perry because the Waukee and the Perry ones are so industrial looking. And there's um, different things we so can do. Um, I, I had submitted uh, in that uh, email, there's um, different end treatments um, and we were proposing to do more of a beveled uh, so it would it would taper with the slope and then uh, it would have some riprap end treatment. Um, to protect from um, erosion around the pipe. It just seemed both the Waukee and the Perry one to me, all that kind of. Yeah, we wouldn't around. we wouldn't have the aluminum wing walls that that come out like that. The other thing to note is that that uh, Bay of Fundy study that was in there, you know, that's uh, that's been in in the ground for 56 years and it's in a, a salt water, a brackish water environment, and it's still rated a seven out of 10. Um, so it, it holds up really well to, to a salty, uh, salt water environment. So uh, I don't think the salts would be an issue with, uh, it, it wouldn't react with this pipe material. Would you explain what you just told us? It's celebrated at a level of seven out of 10? It's uh, the that pipe in that Bay of Fundy case right. study was rated a seven out of out of sorry out of ten with ten being a perfect condition. And it's fifty six years old. And it's fifty six years old. How about the uh, calcium chloride? Um, that's the first I've heard about calcium chloride being an issue. Um, you know, we had asked Matt for um, feedback as to why he he was not um siding with us on this and he didn't give us any good reasoning um and he certainly didn't mention any of the things he just mentioned to you to us so um i'm hearing all of this information about calcium chloride uh on the spot here so i can't i don't have any way to react to it because i haven't been able to do my own research because he didn't give me the uh, uh that information ahead of time so and we had asked we had asked Matt to tell us why he didn't agree with it, and um, he just said maintenance issues. He didn't give us any of this other information, so I'm a little disappointed that we didn't get that ahead of time, so that we could do our own research and and give you information based on that. So I have a quick question here: <clears throat> Aluminium and salt water do do not agree well, they they corrode. Salt water actually corrodes aluminum. And you say one of that structure that you put up there is been seven out of 10 someplace. And that has been for how long? 56 years. 56 years now, and there's no corrosion up there? Uh, I think there are some pictures in that Bay of Fundy study. Um, I thought there was anyways. The Bay of Fundy study. That's going to be in the other email that I sent. Oh, maybe. Sure, it was in that email, but and this 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 structure is in a rural area or an urban area. 
Um, the Bay of Fundy is in uh, in Maine, and it 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 gets tidal water, um, so I assume it's on the in the Bay of Fundy. Um, I don't know anything about that area. Okay. Other than yeah. okay. so, just trying to understand it. But as as student of science, I know that aluminium and salt water don't work very well. They have salt water corrodes aluminium, and sometimes we. The aluminum, there's some kind of a white powder coating that do it. I'm not sure what, how this will agree here. So I'm trying to understand from your perspective, the, the aluminum that you are trying to use. The supplier is telling us that it's inert, that it, that it won't react with the salt water. Mm. Okay. And the cost of the aluminum and the concrete is not much, is that right? Comparable. Comparable. Okay. All right. It's not a huge difference. It's just, uh, uh, you know, we may have some relief on the mitigation if we're able to do the sunken invert. And uh, there is a, a, a little bit of a cost savings, probably 50 to 60,000. Not a huge number. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate that. I guess what is your rat? What, why is it that you want to use? aluminum in this you, why did this, this product what's your just the cost savings and then the also the, the ability to sink the invert and and uh, have the discount on the mitigation uh, we thought we were going to be able to use the mitigation that was already done previously for the street crossing um, further west of here and we're not going to be able to use those credits even though they've already been paid for and I, I'm sorry, when you say for the mitigation and the credits, I, I'm not tracking. But there was a, the previous mitigation that was done for, um, for that same channel uh, with the project to the west. Um, there, the Brio there was, or whatever. Brio, yeah, with the Brio project. Um, there was a, a stream crossing credits for uh, where our road is was going to be located and it didn't line, it doesn't line up with where our road actually needs to be to have a, a full access so that that mitigation credit was for not because that's not where the access point is i, I guess i don't really yeah and i, I can't exp i can't explain it without a, a better picture what of. the objective of the culvert is to have water for it to flow and obviously we need a bigger the 72 inches as opposed to 60 inches um, because of concern about the, the 72 they can still sink the 72 inch pipe to get that natural bottom in there to help with those mitigation costs there they would only need a 60 inch pipe to carry those flows we upsize it to the 72 to help with those mitigation costs to, 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 with the mitigation costs yeah for the for the developer so if you upsize to the 72 and you sink that to give it a natural bottom, that, that helps with those mitigation costs, just like they're wanting to put a natural bottom in the pipe that they're proposing. So a natural bottom doesn't, it's not all the way around. No, it's still all the way around. It, they just they just create, you get the dirt and the silt buildup in the bottom of it. Yeah. So that it creates that natural stream bed effect. And it's not just concrete pipe shooting through there. So. I do see Patrick in the audience. Patrick, can, are you able to comment on your concerns? Uh, Matt said that you had some concerns about abrasion and durability. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing, um, <clears throat> when you kind of weigh the two alternatives in there, the cost to me is is negligent, and, and we think maybe the concrete could even be a little cheaper from our seat, from what we're looking at. Um, and it's really kind of the resiliency, the long-term uh, sustainability of the product. Um, the um, Based on our feedback, we reached out to several contractors and they told us that they've installed one, I think last time was about two or three years ago. And well, it had to be before that because they had to go back twice during the maintenance bond period. So it had to be at least um, four years ago and do some maintenance on it. And with this type of construction on a metal culvert, in a metal culvert, you gotta be extremely um, diligent about how it's constructed in the backfill as it goes around it, because as the backfill interacts with the existing ground, that keeps the pipe fixed and so it won't squash. So that interaction, and there's 
very variable soil conditions that can end up um, causing that culvert to deflect. So how that all gets built in the metal culverts or the aluminum culvert side of things compared to the concrete, which the construction methods are a little less forgiving or more forgiving, um, they don't, it doesn't have to be the perfect uh, situation then um, you got a long-term, you don't have to worry about the long-term maintenance. And that's the biggest thing we heard from the contractors is having to come back during that maintenance bond period that they're required to perform and having to go back and either replace payment, come to redo the, uh, the backfill. Um, and so that's, that's probably the biggest reason for us, I would say, um, particularly when the culvert, the pricing, it seems to be in line uh, with it. So um, the other thing we heard, um, is a supply issue potentially of getting an action to the rig to fill. Um, labor's really tight right now. Uh, one contractor said, you know, there's hundreds, thousands of bolts you got to put in and piece this thing together out in the field. Um, they would much rather show up, uh, unload some pipe, put it in the ground, and move on. So um, from that, the constructability and, and everything um, is, is probably the key, I would say. So hopefully that wasn't too deep technical or whatever, but I can answer any questions if you have. So Patrick, you're recommending concrete versus aluminum? Yeah, I would, I would stick with concrete, particularly in the urban setting. Um, it, it's just, um, to me, to try to um, not have the big opening um, and hide the pipe a little more, the bigger opening, it's a little more visible in the urban setting. The context to me, in a real situation, okay, you know, it's you could probably get by with it, but in the urban setting, um, it, it would just, um, to me, the, the concrete's a little, a little more hidden. Patrick, in your conversations with contractors, did they um, cite any other examples besides the ones that we have here of Perry and, and Waukee where this- There was one um, in a park someplace, I don't know, they didn't really say where, where specifically it was um, that they, they had to deal with. And, and um, I just know they, they, they had their best crew on it and they still had issues with it. So um, they, they're a little frustrating when they got to come back and, and keep touching it up, so. So it's relatively untested is what I'm hearing. In, in Iowa, um, in applications in, in urban settings in Iowa? The, the corrugated metal pipe, not the aluminum side, has been installed in a lot, a lot of county roads. Um, my dad's almost 90 years old, that's what they built back sure i would say a long time ago and he has a lot of stories about that um i know when i worked in construction we installed some we didn't quite get the backfill right the egg shaped on us and stuff so the constructability is kind of a big thing um and, and just for me the speed of construction in today's environment is also huge and that i think equates to the cost savings or the the uh, cost of, of the products so. any other questions for patrick Patrick, I'm going to pose a question to you, and if you can't, I'd have you defer to Matt. Is it your entity, the, your organization, that goes out and inspects uh, our city culvert kind of waterways uh, currently? Uh, in other words, how do we, how do we measure a uh, level of deterioration? As uh, I know that's a study that they're conducting in Maine uh, or the Bay of Fundy uh, up there, uh, and they can rate uh, metal as seven out of 10, but is, is someone either from city staff or from your engineering staff going out to evaluate our, our culvert uh, and piping on a regular basis to make sure we're safe? Not on a regular basis. We'll go back and do our four-year bond walkthrough. Um, if we receive a complaint, we'll go back and check those. Um, if we have some erosion in a channel or, or flood, um, such as like, 2018 we'll go through and, and check those culverts because generally we've got to go out there clear those culverts um, and and be able to pull the material off of them uh, that's one of the things that it's another thing that, that patrick had mentioned in, in looking at the pictures you've got a large opening so you can get debris and other large items stuck in there at least with our concrete pipes it generally kind of stacks up on the ends makes it a little bit easier for us to maintain go down and pull that material off of them and clear them out okay we don't we don't inspect those culvert structures like that on a on an annual basis it's kind of as needed if we if we say right, yeah. thank you matt remind me where we're at in the process of giving some direction back on this i mean is it is time of the essence is this a, you know, 
something that we need to be deciding now as opposed to give it further study and maybe we can get comfortable with it or from my understanding i believe they're wanting to move forward so that if they know the direction they need to go to right. be able to to mitigate that channel and get the development moving forward um, i might may want to defer to, to melissa on that yeah. so it sounds like i think they were here a couple of weeks ago and ready at that right. But, you know, I guess at this point, um, well, I, I would tend to want to be flexible and try to find ways to to work with uh, the a developer. I have concerns just about the physical look of it um, and I, kind of the urban setting kind of point. I just I, I'm so I, I would have a hard time supporting it, whether it's tonight or two weeks from now or four weeks from now. And so. I like the looks of it, but I'm concerned about what I'm hearing in terms of the uh, the durability and the maintenance issues involved in it. And that's why, you know, if we had more time to study a little bit more, I'd say, you know, maybe maybe we could get there with with this product because I I, I think it's attractive. But, okay. <laughs> okay. but um, I, it, it sounds like we need to need to make a decision and, and move on. And I guess um, based on what we're hearing, there's enough uncertainty about whether or not this is a good application of it that I I guess I would feel uncomfortable going forward and approving it. So uh, other thoughts? I also agree. Uh, I, I like the, the look, uh, frankly, and cosmetically, I actually uh, could see something in that capacity. M my bigger concern is that maintenance side. I have to defer to our experts and to our city staff for, for you have to maintain this for the sake of all of our safety. And, and so quite frankly, uh, when we see, and even though it was the corrugated steel uh, or the galvanized steel, um, which was allowed at the time, it's no longer, uh, I kind of have to defer in that same vein. At this point in time, the aluminum, corrugated aluminum is not considered an acceptable material for our uh, waterways. And, and until that changes, if Patrick at some point wants to try to come forward or other entities to try to add that to our uh, acceptable material, then maybe we'd consider it. But at this point, uh, it's rather moot to me. I, I don't support it. I think what else would be helpful is if we saw for other many other applications similar to this in, in other you know, other communities where it just, you know, it, it looks more obvious that it's, it, uh, it's an appropriate fit. And we just don't have a lot of examples. And we can continue over the over the next few years to reach out to the to those cities and, and see what their experience is. I think we those. need to do that. Check yeah. in on them from time to time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. The next item on the agenda is a discussion of the water and sewer utility cash flow and rate view. Matt's back again. <laughs> can you, can you hear me okay? Do I need? Kind of tall, Matt. <laughs> I feel like I always have. Okay. Every year we look. Is can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I don't think so. I'm not sure it's on. I have to hold it a little closer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just closer to my mouth. Okay. Every year we look at the the city's uh, water and sewer rates in, in the spring, um, and then. We'll make a recommendation on what the city needs to do, if anything, on the rate, on the current rates based on you know the the current funds within the each each utility fund, the CIP, any debt planning that's coming up, and any other considerations such as WRA, uh, Central Iowa Water or Des Moines Water Works rate increases. And so last year we were kind of at our our cycle where we would have recommended a multi-year rate increase. But because of all of the uncertainty, we decided that we would just do a one-year sewer rate adjustment and then kind of deferred to the spring for a multi-year rate adjustment. So I don't know if we want to start with water or sewer, but let's start with sewer since we're making a recommendation there. Um, do the, the Johnston sewer cash flow. Um, so what we're recommending for the sewer fund is a is a nine percent rate increase for the next three years, um, and so the you know the biggest changes and the biggest driver of this, uh, the sewer fund is in a really good position, 
um, as healthy cash balance, you know, strong coverage considering, but you know, the annexation improvements, uh, you know, total about $19 million. And so bringing on the new debt for, for those annexation improvements is really kind of the driver behind the, the recommended rate increase. The city is putting uh, $3 million of ARPA funds towards those projects. Um, but at last year at this time, there was still some discussion on if those were gonna happen, how much were they were gonna be, but now they're on the IUP. I mean, the, the city has given direction to move forward with that. So I think now is, is the right time to, you know, to, to lock in these next three rate increases. Um, you know, if you looked at the, the sewer rates um, for the Metro or the ones that I put together, you can notice that Johnston's kind of on the lower end of that with the exception of the, the sewer districts that are on there. You know, Johnston is the lowest. Um, and so, you know, part of me thinks about it kind of as a pendulum a little bit, like when you're on the low end side of the rates, uh, it's only a matter of time before you have to take on some projects that kind of swing you up to the other end. And so, um, so before I kind of just keep talking about the sewer uh, fund, I know several of you were in the finance committee where we spent over an hour discussing these. Um, let me stop and see what kind of questions maybe some of the other council members have as we, as we discuss the sewer fund. Questions for Matt? I don't see any, man. No questions. No. Okay. Um, and so tonight on the on the council agenda, there'll be the the first reading of the ordinance um, for the council to take official action on. So if you have questions uh, that would come up later at that time, feel free to ask those questions now as well. I could answer, or I can answer them too. Um, so on the water side, you I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you for just a second, Matt. Sure. One of the things, Council, in the two exhibits that you had on both of this cash flows, um, just in case, Councilman Burkhart, I don't know if you've ever seen this um, layout before or not, but um, on the sewer one, as an example, lines five and six, that always um, calculates for us what the average monthly bill is for a citizen in Johnston um, and then what the fee change would be for them. So you can always closely look at this cash flow and be able to see what that is. And the other thing, Matt, if you will just remind them of the assumptions you make, the growth assumptions you make for us. Yep. And that's yeah. up in your the left hand corner of the front page of the sewer. Yeah, so uh, appreciate that, Teresa. So we assume for, for gallons sold, we assume that gallons are going to continue to kind of just stay flat. Um, I, I feel like that's a conservative assumption, um, but it's not too conservative that it pushes rates higher than they otherwise would need to be. Uh, the WRA growth assumptions is probably the biggest thing that I pay a lot of attention to. And so um, the city pays the WRA for the treatment of, of most of its sewer and or sewage. And so that those cost allocations from the WRA are based on a flow growth. So they, they meter the whole Metro and then they decide how much of Johnston's flow makes up the total flow. So those, so I'm assuming that, that Johnston will grow at 4% flow growth um, for kind of 25 and out. But for 2024, I take what's been the highest flow growth that we've seen recently and so I've used 6% flow growth for 2024, because if I use the highest, then hopefully next year we won't be surprised if it's, if it's a similar to that, um, which this year it was five and a half and it was, it was relatively high. It was higher than we had kind of built in. But, um, and then in terms of the number of, of meters, um, we are currently uh, projecting, a, a, you know, the three-year average, which is about 277 meters and that's in line nine. Um, so 277 new meters per year is kind of what we're adding to the city. Um, and we, we look at that and we try to adjust it to like the three year average. Um, so, you know, we build in the budget, the way it is adopted by the city. We build in the, the, um, the year to date, if there's any year to date adjustments, 
Um, you know, and then we model the rate increases. If you go to the next page, Cindy, um, and go, let me see. Actually, so this is this is all of the the operating expenses, um, and then the 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 revenue debt is really the biggest piece. So those those orange lines, like 39, 40, 41, that's all the funding of the 19 million dollar annexation improvements. 19 million minus three, so 16 million of, of new bond proceeds. But then a, a big pressure on the on the city's uh, obligate future obligations is. WRA. So WRA is planning on another $400 million worth of debt to, to fund, uh, you know, all of the treatment facilities. So we try to build in all of that future debt. If, if the city's agreed to it in the 2080 and it's known, we try to build it in there for those future years. So you can see the WRA debt continues to go up. And then if you go to the next page, Cindy, that, that 110 that I highlighted down there, you know, that's what I'm solving for. I'm trying to do no more rate increases than we absolutely have to have to kind of meet that, 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 that covenant. So you covenant to the WRA that you'll have enough, um, enough revenues in order to, to have 110 coverage on all your debt. Um, so I look at that 59 very closely. And then if you go to the next page, um, and then for here, you know, you have a lot of capital. You have probably more cash than you need in the bank today, but that helps you as you're getting to ready to take on a lot more capital. But over time, I want to get that fund back to like 50 to 100% um, in line 78. And so you can see over time, you know, we spend that down. And we look at this every year. And, you know, if we, if the assumptions are wrong and we think we only needed five, Next year at this time, we'll come back and we'll say, instead of doing a 9%, let's do a 5%. We'll adjust the ordinance. Or if we needed a 15, because you're not going to meet your covenants, we've come back and we've said that too. So um, so we look at it every year, but we try to only take action on the rates once every three years. So. Okay. Um, on the water side uh, we're not making it we're not recommending a rate increase at this time so if you looked at the, the sewer you would be at, on the lower end of the of the sewer rates if you look at the water you're not the highest but you are on the higher end of the water rates um, you are one of the only you are the only community that's paying a hundred percent of your water buying a hundred percent of your water from des moines at the with storage rate um, I think central, you know, I presented already to the council that I think central Iowa um, will help. Uh, Matt, can I just interrupt you for a second? Yeah. I, you have so on your rate thing here. Yep. So we're at projected at $57.66. Yep. And I'm having a hard time reading number 19 down there. Could you maybe read that for the record? Say it again. What is 19? What is line 19? Xenia. I'm sorry. I'm trying to make a point that their rates are really much higher. <laughs> oh yeah. So sorry. Okay. I was I was trying to be too cute. And so noted. <laughs> yeah. If if you would you switch to the chart that's got the the you know the comparable rates. Yeah, for water. Thank you. I just think it's kind of ironic that you were talking about our rates maybe being a little bit higher, and their rates are. Yeah. Sixty dollars higher than us. It, yeah, um, almost twice as much. Yeah, almost. Yeah, double. Um. Yeah, you can see the, the difference there. And they're obviously the outlier, uh, but yeah, their rates. Uh, Sorry, my bad. That's okay. Um, so all of the things taking in, I mean, there's still a lot of uncertainty in the water cash flow. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, I've met with the Economic Development Committee. I met with the Finance Committee. I think that a lot of the capital that you're doing, you can take on without additional debt. You know, there's still time to decide if Central Iowa Regional Water does come come together and you do have to have a buy-in. I still think the lower rates in addition to the buy-in is gonna be less than you're currently paying Des Moines Water Works. We've, I've got Des Moines Water Works kind of built in here as it currently is. Um, they didn't pass on a rate increase this last year. We kind of always plan for a 5% rate increase. And so the fact that they didn't do one um, for Johnston helps. 
Um, one thing I didn't mention in the sewer, but I think is worth pointing out is that I currently am cash funding the portions for east of Merle Hay out of water and sewer, which will be a big, uh, big win, I think, from a logistical standpoint of funding that that next phase of those projects, if we can do that. Um, because stormwater certainly will need SRF loans, and then the geo side will probably have to include in the annual CIP borrowing. So, but that was a tangent. Um, so no rate recommendation in water, and I'm happy to answer, you know, questions. The one thing that I don't have factored in here that could be a little bit of a curveball is if there is some type of a a buyout from Xenia, if you do get to an annexation agreement where you serve those customers and they make you purchase per meter or per acre or something to that effect. I've modeled that separately uh, for multiple groups within Johnston, but that's currently not built into these rates. I don't think it'll move the needle in a big way, but it, it certainly is a factor. And if, if it needs to change, we'll update that as soon as we know it. Did Other I miss anything, Teresa or Jim? Okay. Teresa, we have the sewer rate adjustment on the work, uh, regular meet, meeting agenda this sure. evening. Any other comments or questions? <laughs> Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. Thank you. We have one additional item on the agenda this, this evening, and that is a pre presentation from AKC Marketing on city project naming concepts. Good evening, Council. Um, staff has been working with AKC Marketing over the last month on two areas that we're looking to potentially name, first being the Northwest Annexation Area which is sort of distinct from the rest of the city, a little bit separated, and perhaps an opportunity to look at something like uh, Waukee's done with Kettlestone or Urbandale with the Urban Loop uh, to kind of assign a name to that region so people understand that it's part of Johnston, <clears throat> but also sort of its, its own entity that uh, people would recognize as well. Uh, the second is the Loop Road that will go um, west off Merle Hay Road, just off of Johnston Drive, and then circle down south back on the Merle Hay Road. Uh, adjacent to it. So we've met with AKC a couple times uh, to talk about uh, the history of those areas and some potential naming conventions. Uh, they put together a nice uh, quick short presentation on some of that background and a few of those ideas for feedback and then some direction on how to proceed with these. Uh, so we have Kyle Webb and uh, Anne Marie Edwards here to, to walk us through that and I think uh, there should be a short PDF attached there. All right, good evening. Good evening. Uh, so like Adam said, we've uh, been working on uh, some naming options for both the Northwest annexation area and the uh, road and park down by Ignite and Bombers. Um, start with the Northwest annexation area. We, we kind of took a geographical consideration uh, with the road acting as kind of a division splitting the north and south areas, north being a little bit higher in elevations, south being a little bit lower. So we kind of played on that a little bit, taking into consideration the, uh, the trees in the area, the local groundwork. So we came up with some options here, uh, Shale Oak Ridge being the, the north side, if you wanted to split it into two, Shale Oak Glen being the south side. Uh, silver Clay was uh, another option that we came up with based off the, the silver linden tree and the clay that you can find around here. Um, same thing with Lindenfell and Lindendale, the, uh, uh, based off the silver linden tree. We also played off the Latin root uh, of some certain words. I know that uh, with Terra Park, we were kind of maybe trying to tie all of that together through some Latin work. Um, came up with, with Ventus, uh, Ventus Ridge, Ventus Valley, Ventus being Latin for wind. You know, it's pretty windy in that area. Um, Tribus Tract, uh, another option, uh, it's lat tri Latin for, for three. Um, Silve Ridge, again, kind of playing off of the, the high and low. Uh, Silve is just Latin for woods. Um, and then Trimeros, kind of giving it uh, both a, a Latin and uh, Hispanic feel. Tri is actually, uh, again, Latin for three, but uh, Meros is Greek for of many. 
or a combination of. And then we have more options at the end, but uh, moving on to the, the road park area, we kind of tied these together, thought maybe business themed would be a way to go uh, without directly tying to the businesses because businesses come and go um, with Bombers and Ignite as the two anchors in that area. Um, so Tris Loop and Park was one option we came with. Came up with Tris is a combustible material that is actually also corrosive in water, so you have the fun little water play. Um, spring uh, is is actually one of my favorites. It, it seems very basic on the surface, but uh, with what we're trying to do in that area with the green belts and the relaxation, you have the double meaning of the word spring both for you know, a time of rebirth, renewal for the springtime season, and then spring is in a body of water, a place where people can go and relax. Um, Brennan Loop and Park, another one that we were playing with, uh, it's based off the Fruitland Brennan, um, oh, I forget the actual term they used, but the, the group that was formed in, I think, 1915 to bring electricity to the area. And then Southerwick Loop and Park, was Southerwick is the, the first mayor of Johnston. And then playing off that Latin root, again, trying to tie that all together, uh, we came up with some, some Latin themed names here, forest loop, um, Latin for just outside. So you have the, the, the park outside, the recreation area outside. Uh, Cassis loop, if you wanna get a little bit more technical, Cassis is Latin for adventure. So you have these sports complexes. Uh, so you've got that adventure component, potentially with the uh, waterway, you know, the rafting and, and kayaking adventure. And then Ludo Loop. Uh, Ludo is quite literally just sport. So um, it's got that nice alliteration to it. And it also ties in with the athletic component that might be there. And then Verdant Loop. You see a lot of that, uh, that play off of green. Verdant is, is Latin for green. So you have the green of the park or, you know, Johnston Green Days. And then we have a, a bunch of additional options here uh, that didn't really fit into any particular theme, but we wanted to present them anyway as just potential options for your consideration. I do have a question. I'm sorry, what is the name again? Kyle Webb. Thank, thank you for this. This is really good information and you put a lot of effort into doing all of this. But the question here is, the city is changing in demographics yeah and there's a lot of different ethnicity that comes by into the city and i think you should have also consider adding names based off of different ethnicity and things like that as to change this will become a major thing so i don't see any of these names doing any ethnicity there yeah we we've just dis we discussed that um i mean we can certainly go down that route if the, if the council wishes uh, we were trying to stick with, you know, just that Latin root that already exists with the Terra Park, hence the Terra, or hence the, the Latin theming that we had. Otherwise, it was just mostly geographical considerations or business. Right. Considerations. I understand that. But as I was just saying, yeah. oh, absolutely. ethnic I agree. city keeps changing. We are no longer just Caucasian in this city. It's changing quite a bit. And you need to like, think about long term future. So trying to add those, change those names or add a get different ethnic cities into this play could be nicer to make sure that city is a welcoming city to everybody. And we have Cotewa. Cotewa has a lot of different ethnicity. They work for that and they come and go. And I know people from South America come by, Asia come by to work here. And they have this, if they see something like the names that actually shows that this city is welcoming and with their ethnicity that will be really really helpful to that so while we are doing this new changes new addition of course we can't grow anymore i mean johnston is a landlocked city you can't grow anymore other than northwestern accession right so i think this might be the good time to change those names to reflect the changing ethnicity in this city so something to consider Very good. thanks um so I was thinking about these names too a while back, and I did send an email to these guys. I don't know if they remember that email, but what struck me about the Loop Road, 
that Ignite is going to be off of. And then Bombers came along. For me, I was thinking not so much business names as in, I think that we have kind of this recreational thing going for our whole town, not just the park area. And, you know, we have all these really exciting new um, places to recreate and we're building upon that in terms of, uh, you know, kind of a theme for us. So the sort of the names I was thinking uh, would be, I was looking for something energetic and maybe sort of sports related like Catalyst Circle um, is one of the ones I had. Um, Catch Fire Circle, Combustion Loop, you know, sort of those kind of things. Now, I think there's probably, you know, like I'm pretty sure Destination is out there everywhere. Um, but I was thinking that we could go more Kickstart Circle, you know, um, that was my hope. That I mean, I get the diversity thing too. I mean, if you can do it all in one lane, great. <laughs> I don't know how you would do it. Um, but that would that was kind of my thoughts um, in terms of naming, at least specifically for along Merle Hay Road. I have no, uh, I haven't given any thoughts to the Northwest area at all. Can you provide a little bit of background behind the last uh, in the additional ideas on the Northwest annexation? Flumenville, if I'm pronouncing that right. I that's, saw that too. <laughs> the, 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 the others, the others, I have enough historical context uh, to be able to place. But that one, uh, can you explain? <laughs> um, again, I believe it's what. Could you mind using the microphone, please? Oh. I actually am trying to remember myself if if it is a limit um, a bid to I, I would have to remember for sure but okay. yeah I I think Futuro loop uh, might talk a little bit about the future um, some of those you know radiant we tried to you know include radiant spark that sort of thing that would go along with ignite um, again tried to uh, tie in the green with Verde, the Green Meadows area kind of extending. Um, and then of course, a bit, a lot to the history. So, yep. I would still consider adding more ethnic cities, ethnic names in this, at least for the Northwest annexation area. And the sports complex, both of this, uh, Marley Road, sports related. That could be ideal situation, I guess. Yeah, I guess I would say I, I appreciate kind of the thought process and gives us some things to think about. I hadn't even thought about when you said the Latin that Terra, I wasn't thinking of that as a Latin term, so. I thought it was named after a chemical company, but no. <laughs> and just always, that's been the name. And I will tell you, naming is not, I mean, we talked, I can't, for how long we talked about, let's come up with a new name for Terra Park. We never did. You know, we've kind of gone through this and have struggled with this. So, um, I mean, I think this gives us some thoughts and others have kind of thrown theirs out. I tried to find Rhonda's email. I couldn't find it right off the top, but so, I mean, it's some things to think about, but I, I, nothing sort of, you know, it's sort of like naming a child, you know, it's like sometimes it's like, oh yeah, that's perfect. And then, and then, um, and otherwise you keep looking. So I don't know. And I'm kind of where Councilman Cope is. I'm, I'm looking at these and I see some that have some appeal, but nothing really goes, yeah, that's it. That is it. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I guess I'm thinking that what we probably need to do is give this some more thought. Um, and I don't know if we need to, let me just kind of take the temperature of the council here, maybe pull together a work group, kind of work through these, work through the other ideas that have already been suggested, some of the themes of it that have been proposed, and see if we can't narrow it down to a few, and uh, then figure out what to do with that few. <laughs> We have in the past, you know, put it to a vote for our, a, a, a straw vote for our public to, to weigh in on. I don't know that we want to do that in this particular situation, but uh, we might want to do some testing of some sort to just see how 
our residents react to it. But I think I, this, you've done a lot of good work here. You've come up with a lot of, a lot of great suggestions. And I think we're just feeling a little overwhelmed right now um, in terms of giving you any feedback. So I think we need to probably task it to a, a, a smaller group, have them sit down and wrestle with it, kind of sift through it, pull out some ideas, and then figure out where we go from there. I'd just like to add that I agree with the mayor that I'm willing to help you out with setting up names based on the different ethnicity of the city and just we can work together. I mean, if there's anybody in the council that works with me, we can work together on that. So just get in touch with me. We'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jim, we have about four minutes left. Do you want to cover anything that would have come come under uh, city administrator comments? I'll go ahead and talk about a few things. Some of them are activities that are coming um, up. Um, this Friday night, there is a movie in the yard. Tangled is going to be shown um, in the yard. I think it begins at 8.30 Friday evening. I think you've gotten most of these uh, this information in the email. Uh, just a reminder, next Monday, we do have a joint meeting with the Planning and Zoning Commission and the City Council. That's on the 23rd, and that's related to the zoning code update. So that, uh, that'll be a week from tonight. Um, on June 4th, we have the Family Fun Fest, and I know Jana's been getting information out. I think she sent a poster out to the Mayor and Council to show you the different activities that are planned for, for that event, and that's from 11 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Um, a couple of meetings that we recently had. Um, one, we hosted the Grow Solar meeting uh, a, a week or so ago, and uh, that's the program where they're promoting uh, solar energy for residential properties and uh, they chose our location because we do have solar on our building as being the kickoff there's going to be i think about 17 of these around the metro area something like that and so um, but what they've done is they've they've uh, contracted with a solar provider gotten a, a price for them to provide solar and have shared that information and and give have given residents an opportunity to to sign up and take advantage of a group buy or you know a high volume buy for potentially putting solar on their um, on their property, and so the first meeting, as I said, was uh, here a week or so ago, and and uh, very pretty well attended. I think we probably had thirty or forty people here, and it was uh, it was a good good meeting. Um, and then I, I attended a meeting last Thursday, the the Green Bucket Shindig. Uh, which was sponsored by Mid-American Energy. It was held in West Des Moines. But through Trees Forever, there's going to be an effort to plant, I believe, a, a million trees in the central Iowa area um, over the last, next so many years. And um, uh, there'll be more information to come out on that. But uh, there was a lot of conversation. The, the director from uh, for um, uh, trees forever I came to the event and, and talked about what they've been doing across the world and there is going to be a real effort to to um, do a lot of tree planting over the next many years uh, in the central Iowa area so uh, it was really rolling out the the idea or the thought that was um, uh, that they want to in, in incorporate into the communities and we'll get additional information and of what they'd like, you know, how they would like Johnson and the other communities to participate in that process. But it was a very interesting meeting, and uh, I know a lot of enthusiasm for uh, this effort that they're going to that they're going to make. So that's what I had as far as meetings recently. Um, any questions on any of those? Have we had any events the last week or two? <laughs> well, <laughs> we have had some events the last week or two. Um, I, uh, I guess the first thing to talk about was our event we had here Friday evening with the uh, prime so you're minister. Going backwards instead of go ahead. <laughs> What's that? Go ahead. Oh. Uh, with the prime minister of Kosovo in um, at City Hall. And it was a fantastic event. Got to give Cindy a lot of credit. She's the one that was really the, the glue behind all of us and in, in pulling this together. She did a fantastic job in getting everything coordinated between. She even made the centerpieces. <laughs> <laughs> between Johnston and, and the consulate's office and a, a very, very nice event. Um, we, were, we showed off very well what our community is and what it's about. And this building just was a fantastic venue for, 
for an event like that. So that was last um, uh, Friday night. Also, um, we, um, uh, I'll, I'll mention that the mayor also had a meeting uh, with some Kosovar um, visitors last Monday and particularly talking about women in leadership. And so Paula, uh, the mayor uh, posted that meeting and uh, they had that here at City Hall as well. So there's been a lot of activities related to our relationship with Kosovo. And all four women were involved in municipal government in some fashion, either as elected officials or as department heads. And the other thing uh, I want to mention about Saturday morning, we had the mayor's bike ride, um, uh, annual bike ride. And again, very well attended. Um, beautiful day for the event. Uh, it was great to see families of all ages here for the event. Um, I do want to make sure we recognize John and Nate and Carrie for their efforts there. They did a great job. We met here at 1130 and followed the trail around the Terra Park where uh, Ivy provided the food. Um, John was the chef. John Smith was the chef um, cooking up the, the brats that, that morning, but that was a, a very, um, very well attended event. I had one resident come up to me and say, you guys need to plan an event for every weekend you bring the most beautiful weather every time you plan something for us and um that's um that's all i have for this evening oh well it is seven o'clock so why don't we uh why don't we adjourn the work session and we'll go into the regular meeting